my background, um, I'm, I'm a technologist at heart. I was building uh, hardware back in the day. I got into assembler to, to control that hardware. Then I got into C, Objective C and C++ when the two of them were challenging each other back in the early 80s. Um, I got into Java right at the beginning. I was very fortunate to have a, uh, a job that allowed me, at the time, head of um, foreign exchange at Paribas. Um, it allowed me to get into Java in 95. Um, I've been very big in, in Java in those days. And as Sven said, um, wrote a number of books in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and then, of course, working with Rod Johnson and various people in the spring world. Um, but my, my hobby was always astronomy. Um, I did a degree in it at uh, UCL, University College London. And I'd guess for 35 years after leaving university, to me, astronomy was just something that you had to be in a, in a really dark place. I don't mean mentally. Um, you had to be somewhere where you could see the clouds. Uh, sorry, not see the clouds. Uh, obviously, um, England and um, Netherlands is not one of the best places. And in COVID, um, which we all went through, I thought to hell with it and started to experiment. And I discovered you could get some amazing images. And having a bit of money, having sold my previous company at the time, I invested a bit more in the tools that I have. And I want to sort of walk you through, not, not that part of it, but what actually can be done from pretty much anywhere. And I, what I do in, in central London is, is definitely more than possible pretty much anywhere uh, in the world. So this is my background um, on the math side. One of the things I like is that it's very compatible with, uh, with drinking. It's a favorite hobby of mine. Um, you can do a lot of beer drinking, wine drinking, cocktails, etc. And I actually failed uh, practical astronomy at university because it happened to coincide in the first year, it coincided with cocktail night. And uh, we had to get a bus for several hours up to the north of London to go to the observatory. And, and the two of them conflicted with each other. But it's, we do astronomy at night. And one of the biggest sort of um, additions to this was this little Raspberry Pi, the red device you see there. Um, and that basically, you sit that on the side of the telescope and it controls absolutely everything. But of course, being um, open source, um, that's, a, that's actually one which a company called ASI, uh, or ZWO rather, have created. But uh, I started with a Raspberry Pi, and you could basically code this thing um, in uh, not, I mean, you could use Java, but most of the, most of the stuff there is in, in Python and Assembler or C. Um, but it meant you could basically automate everything and then log in through your phone or through your laptop pretty much anywhere. And, and that made a huge change. So astronomy to me then became, you could set stuff up outside, you could come inside with a glass of wine and, and you could move forward. I have two telescopes now. Um, this large one is almost life-size. It, it's, it's this big when I carry it. The tripod and the mount weigh more than the telescopes, about 50 kilos in total. Um, so it takes two or three trips to get outside. The one in the middle um, is, I can actually lift, technically lift it with one hand, but obviously it's, it's delicate. But I lift it with two hands, pop it down. The one on the left and the right are the same, and by putting the camera on different ends of the telescope, we get a very different um, sort of process. So a bit about photometry. Um, what we're trying to do is collect photons. Um, and the photon is the, almost by definition, the sort of minimum um, quantity of, of, of light. And every one of you, I'm sh absolutely sure now, has a mobile phone in their pocket, and those mobile phones have a camera. And those cameras are used to taking pictures uh, in daylight, even, even quite good at night. But the number of photons you get in daylight are in the trillions um, just for each pixel. Unbelievably large amounts. And you have to have exposures down in the fractions of a second in order to, to avoid limiting those, uh, that light. And often you put filters on there to reduce the light. It's totally the opposite in astronomy. We're collecting single photons. Um, or just a few photons. In your cameras, because we have so much uh, available light, uh, we put what's called a Bayer filter. So you see this rather nice arrangement of uh, blue, green, red. That's what's inside every single uh, sensor that you have in your, in your pocket 
or on your DSLR cameras. And if you look on the bottom right, effectively what's happening from the red, green, and blue that comes through, and there's, there's a, a wider filter because we filter out infrared, we filter out ultraviolet. So the vast majority of the photons are actually being bounced off um, or absorbed by these filters uh, that sit there. So you're actually getting a fraction of the light already for each of these. Now, that's ex exactly precisely what we don't want uh, in astronomy. We want every available photon. So that's how it works in your cameras. And then we, that, just, to, just to show you what we can take, this is one of the sort of first images uh, that I took. Uh, this is on an ordinary DSLR with an ordinary lens uh, from London. Um, so it, it does work. These are quite bright. Uh, just to give you an idea, the moon uh, on this is probably about the size of the smaller one on the top right. So these are pretty large. You can't see them with, the, obviously, the naked eye, otherwise you'd know what they were. Um, you can just see a faint glow without color if you've got a, pair, a good pair of binoculars on these things. So they're, they're, they're quite bright in, for, in terms of terrestrial objects. What we do um, is to use, so go, quickly go back to that image. The blue here is oxygen emission. The red is hydrogen emission. Now, hydrogen is the most common element uh, across the universe. And, and so it's, it's, it's everywhere, literally everywhere. And hydrogen, um, given the right uh, amount of energy, uh, emits what's called hydrogen alpha and beta and various other things. But hydrogen alpha is red. It's very fortunate that it fa falls right in our visible range. The oxygen, that's oxygen three. Um, and we have filters. So if you see here on the right-hand side, um, on the bottom, I've put the visible light spectrum. And these, what we do is use these filters. Now, if we have a filter which allows precisely that wavelength and nothing else through, I mean, you've, you've all looked through a red piece of glass, that lets red light through, but it lets a big spectrum through. So what these are is very specialized filters that let a very, very precise wavelength through. And these go down to as low as, I've seen 2.8 nanometers, which is very, very fine. The red part of the spectrum, as you can see, is about 100 nanometers in terms of width. Then it goes into orange and infrared, etc. The advantage of these filters is that it filters out all of the rest of the light. And for someone living in London, we have a lot of light. And it would be this, precisely the same here in Amsterdam or any, any other city you live in or even near. The city reflects off the atmosphere. Obviously, if it, would, it reflects off the clouds, but if there's clouds, you can't see anything at all. And what we're trying to do is reduce this noise, because this noise is actually stronger than the signal, i.e. those nebulae that we're trying to get. So we use these filters in order to take the um, astronomical photos. Sadly, they're not, they're, uh, not cheap. They're very, very expensive. Um, so you see a lot of people beginning astronomy want to get into um, astrophotography. Um, these filters can cost as much, and if not more, than the actual um, lens or uh, telescope you're using. The one on the right, um, these are pounds, euros, dollars, you know, they're all sort of pretty close. Uh, as you know, it's to give you an idea of the source of price. So when you get these filters, you're looking at three, four hundred pounds or three, four hundred euros to buy these things. And you typically need three um, because you're mapping them into red, green, and blue. You can make do with two. Um, and there are actually filters which um, combine two wavelengths in one filter, and that, that makes things uh, cheaper. Uh, so th there's a way of getting started with these. But they are not cheap, and unfortunately, it's one of the sort of hurdles to, to getting into this. Um, I do a lot of cycling, as you can probably tell from the difference in the uh, suntan, no suntan. Um, and everyone says how expensive cycling is, because there's always a better bike, and there's always a new power meter, and there's all these new bits. But astronomy is even worse, um, and you sort of you have um, um, how can I say this? Um, aperture envy. There we go. I was going to go on to width, but we're not going to get there or length. But um, we, we have sort of, you look at different things and uh, you sort of, oh, I need one of those. That's going to get me better photographs, etc. These, to give you an idea here, um, this is the Dumbbell Nebula taken a few weeks ago uh, from my back garden. 
Some of the smaller stars you can see there, I wasn't quite sure how this would come out on the projector, but some of the smaller stars on the top there, not, not the two big bright ones, they're down to magnitude 15. Um, now, to give you an idea of magnitude, the sun is magnitude minus 26. It's a logarithmic scale. Um, the brightest stars are about magnitude zero. By definition, Vega is magnitude zero. It's actually been adjusted very slightly with more modern technology. Um, the darkest star, or the faintest star you can see with the naked eye in a forest, uh, totally dark, is about magnitude six. If you've got great eyesight, maybe magnitude seven. So five magnitudes is a hundred times uh, different. So it's the fifth root of 100, which is 2.5. So each magnitude is 2.5 times darker than the next. So some of these smaller stars on the top are about magnitude 15. Uh, so magnitude 15 would be a, a hundred times a hundred times a hundred, uh, so effectively a million times uh, dimmer than Vega. And there are literally, as you go darker and darker and darker and smaller stars, there are literally tens or hundreds or thousands of millions of these, of these things. Um, but from those stars, we get about 300 photons per second per square meter. Your average telescope has got an opening about that large. That's not a square meter, that's a small fraction of a square meter. And so by the time we get the photons into these, we're, we're down to about 20 photons per minute. And we've got to actually, we've got to make that register. So you're looking for a camera which has um, what's called a, a QE, uh, quantum efficiency of turning those photons into electrons so you can measure them. And that's what we're trying to measure. The problem is the light pollution is typically around, certainly in London, is around 50 electrons. So we're trying to measure a signal of 20 in light pollution of 50 or more. Um, and that's the, that's the noise that we get. This is where the, a lot of um, maths and uh, computing comes into this. Now, obviously, if you just look it up in a book um, and you just take photographs, that's fine. Anyone into photography here, generally? Yeah, a few hands. So, I mean, there's two ways. My wife's a photographer, so she takes photographs because she has a great eye for it. So she lines up the photographs, and that's what she does. She left at 6 o'clock this morning. She came over to Amsterdam and to go and photograph some people in a forest um, out towards Utrecht. Um, she doesn't go into the maths of it. To me, as a mathematician, everything is mathematics, and I work on, on that side of it. And so... I get interested in how it works. And in astronomy, it's, it's, everything is there, it stays there, it's there the same every night, and it's there it's typically for hundreds of years exactly the same. So it gives us something constant we can start to measure. This is the sort of formula that you're looking at to integrate this light cone that you get over pixels. And so what we're trying to do here is to work out how bright the pixel is to make sure that we don't overexpose, and so the pixel goes above its it's called a full well depth, i.e. the maximum that it can go, so we don't bleach it out. So we want some color in there. Um, and also, you're trying to work out the noise ratios and things. So I do a lot of, I, I basically prototype this in an Excel spreadsheet. I use um, existing papers from NASA uh, and various other reputable um, sources. And I look at the maths that they've done because they work through these processes. They give quite a lot of the background on it. I build these. Uh, this is just a section of the spreadsheet. I build these with all the scenarios, and those are my test cases. And I implement those typically in Java. And what I'm looking at, if you see on the far right-hand corner, this is just, again, Excel spreadsheet, is I'm looking to work out so that's what the light from a single star will look like. Now, you may or may not wonder some people don't even wonder why the moon is bright. And so they just assume the moon's up there and it's bright. And you tell them that it's a reflection from the sun. They go, whoa, I thought it had a light in it. There are people like that. They exist. Um, but if you're wondering why the brighter stars are bigger, it's not because they're bigger. They're all a single point of, of light, every single one of them. It's because basically you have this Gaussian um, three-dimensional light curve as a pin at the, at the top. And because of diffraction, it spreads it out. Now, the brighter that star is, the more of that light curve that you see. And so what I'm trying to work out here is exactly what part of the star you can see and how big the, the light curves are. And we can compensate for that in what's called deconvolution. So we can 
we understand what that light cone is, we can actually extrapolate and get back to those pinpoint light sources. Um, because we're doing long exposures, um, typically five, 10 minutes, um, in, in an ideal world, we'd actually do an exposure for a, of a couple of hours. And so if, if you left the camera on for a few hours, this is typically what you'd see. This is the Orion Nebula with satellites. Um, thank you to Elon Musk now for um, pushing up these, these big piles of satellites. There's been a lot of controversy about the fact that it's ruining astrophotography. Frankly, it's not really, because uh, you only see the satellites um, at dawn and dusk, because be, uh, as soon as it gets into real night, they're, they're behind the Earth's shadow, so you don't typically see them. Um, you can also mathematically erase them, so it's relatively easy. But this, this is a particular bad example um, of what you'd get. And so what we do is we take shorter um, exposures, and then we simply eliminate the, the bad ones. And you generally don't tend to take um, astronomy at dawn and dusk because there's obviously not enough light, or there's too much light, rather. So we stack these photos. Now, this is another chance to grab another glass of wine or uh, rummage to the fridge for, for a new type of beer or something. When we stack these photos, we're looking at um, a 50 meg file, for example, and we maybe have 200 of these and we've got to align them, uh, we've got to correct them for various different things. And this takes a lot, a huge amount of computing power. This is a 16 core, that was a 16 core machine, this is a new uh, MacBook Pro M2, which is actually faster, has less processors, but it's more efficient. Um, and this goes on and on and on. I have literally seen this sit for 40 minutes uh, at this. On the old laptop, it almost felt like it was gonna take off the ground. Um, and you can imagine with that much uh, core usage, it gets pretty hot. Um, but that's not untypical. You'll see, certainly I've looked at YouTubers where they, they've left it going for hours. And sometimes it's the sort of thing you kick off before you go to bed, um, come back and it's, it's finished in the morning. This is a single shot. This is what you get from a five minute shot with a pretty small telescope, um, no bigger than a, it's basically a 270 millimeter telescope. It's about that big at the end and about that long. So it's small, it's quite compact. This is uh, taken with a hydrogen alpha filter, and this is the crescent nebula, this, just this little bit in the middle. Now, you can start to see some of the dust on the outside of that. Uh, it's not dust, it's, uh, it's actually hydrogen on the, on the outside of it, and it's starting to get a bit wispy. But if you pixel peep, as we call it in this, we, we zoom in, what you'll see is a huge amount of noise it's very speckledy around this. And so that's a five minute one. And then we basically stack 12 of those. So that's one hour's worth. And then we start to use a little bit more uh, technology in this. So what we can do is we can do this overnight, night after night after night. We can build it up. And in the summer, as we have now, there's, there's, basically, there's technically no night at all. We're actually in twilight all the way through the, uh, the night from about 11 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the morning. It's twilight. So we don't get much time in the summer uh, to do astronomy, uh, but we can build this up overnight. It's, it's gonna be exactly the same next year. It's gonna be exactly the same in 20 years time. So we can build these images up with a few exceptions, obviously it's, it does change. And we basically remove the stars from this and that uses a wonderful piece of AI technology, uh, which is brand new to astrophotography. The reason we do this is because if we, if we process this image basically to put more contrast in. Uh, now, just nip back to the previous one. Uh, you obviously understand the scale. You've got, let's say, we'll, we'll, we'll talk eight bits. So we've got 255 at one end, we've got zero at the other end. The vast majority of everything you see here is sitting in the first five to 10. The rest of that scale from 10 through to 255 is black. Oh, it's, it's zero, it has a zero in there. One of these brighter stars, maybe the one on the top in the middle, will have a few pixels down here. So if you look at the histogram of this, it is entirely squeezed on the left-hand side in the dark black. So we have to bring that back out, we stretch it. Now if you've got eight bits of, of information, your average camera has about 12 to 14 bits, good cameras have 16 bits. 
uh, what you end up with, because everything squeezed in the bottom left-hand corner, is, is you have a very bad um, contrast. Everything sort of goes up in steps because you're stretching something which is only 10 pixels wide, sorry, 10 bits wide across the full range. So, but be, when we add these together, we get more and more resolution and we go into a um, floating point processing here. So we can start to bring this out. And the reason we take the stars out is because as we process this, we don't want to process the stars as well. The stars are the same, they stay the same. So this is a bit like an HDR image. We take out the bright bits, which are the stars, and we process the darker bits, and then we add them together at the end. So we take three images, um, hydrogen alpha, sulfur, and oxygen. Uh, what's interesting here, let's see if I can find a, a laser. I usually have one in my bag. I have several in my bag usually, because I like lasers. There we do have a laser. Okay. Never leave home without a laser. You never know when it might come in. There we go. It's great for burning things. And So this is the hydrogen alpha. This is the image we're trying to get. This is all um, effectively hydrogen in here. This is another little interesting thing. I don't know what it is, but it's interesting. You can see this in oxygen, but there's, there's less of this. And this is sulfur. This thing disappears. So we, what we can tell is that, I mean, the, this stuff here that you can see and down here could be twice as far away as this. And so effectively, this thing here is sitting in the foreground or it could be the other way. I, I, I could probably find out. In fact, I'm not even sure if we know, because if you were looking at a cloud, just looking up, you can't tell how close it is or how far it is until the cloud moves and you get some sort of perspective. These things don't move. So a lot of them, we don't know where they are. We don't know whether they're in front of or behind. So that's one of the problems in space is actually trying to get some uh, perspective. But anyway, what we can find out is that when we add these together, we get some rather interesting different effects. Now this is relatively close to how you would see it if you had incredibly good eyesight. Eyes basically the size of the telescope um, that could take long exposures. This is closer to more natural, um, how you would see it. And what I love about this is, is just, it almost looks like fire in here. So this is the hydrogen that we see. Hydrogen is, hydrogen alpha is red. Um, this is in HOO, meaning we put the hydrogen in the, no, this is SHO, sorry. So the sulfur goes in red, H goes in uh, green, and O, oxygen, goes into the blue. And we get a different effect. So where I'm getting to you with this is that when we photograph in narrow bands, uh, narrow band being those tight wavelengths, um, we don't really have to have colors because some of them are, are so close. And then as we go on to the James Webb Space Telescope, it doesn't have any sensors in the visible light range. How are we doing for questions, Sven? Have we got anything? Um, we have one. One. Excellent. I hope. Uh, and, and I missed it. Uh, why are those filters so expensive? It's <laughs> a good question. So why, the question is, why are the filters so expensive? Um, but let me try and explain, well, there's, there's multiple reasons, but the main reason is just supply and demand. Um, the sensors in astronomy, um, we used to use uh, CCD, um, charge couple devices. They were incredibly expensive because nobody else used them, astronomers used them. And so they were made for astronomers. And the weird thing is when we buy a camera, if we buy, an, I, I use astronomy cameras, they're basically exactly the same um, Pro, um, sensor inside as, as they were are in an ordinary camera, except they have cooling because we need to cool it down to avoid the noise. Uh, if you buy a color one, it's cheaper than the black and white one, but the color one has extra material in it and all they need to do is not put that material on it and make the black and white one. The reason it's expensive is because the only people that want a black and white sensor are astronomers and it's supply and demand. Now these filters, the only people that would ever want them are astronomers. And so they're making a very short, uh, a small number of these uh, filters, and that, that's unfortunately. If every one of you, for some reason, found out that on your mobile phone, if you used a hydrogen alpha filter, people looked nicer, or they, you could see more of the smile, all of a sudden, the price of the filters would plummet, and we'd all be able to go out and do astro 
photography much cheaper, but that it's basically supply and demand. Another one. Yeah, they're coming thick and fast. What kind of libraries are you using in Java, and why are you not using Python? Oh, well, actually, this is a Java conference. Um, I use Python a lot. I'm not a Python programmer, but ChatGPT has made me a, an everything programmer now. Um, I use Java because it's my go-to language. Um, again, no pun intended, but... Um, because I know how to basically take arrays of things and process them through with, with streams, and I, I know that. When I look at other languages, um, Clojure and Python and things, I can't get my head around how they deal with arrays. Um, and it's actually simpler, um, but I don't know the syntax. So Java is my first language. I don't use any libraries. Uh, there are some libraries. Um, I think I put them on the later slides. Um, so it's mainly just raw processing on these things. But Python is, is effectively the language that you, you would want to use. And, and again, if I need performance, I'll, I'll drop into C on these things. And, and Excel, effectively. It's, it's coming from a financial services background. Everything is modeled in Excel. Model it, and then implement it. So Excel is slow, difficult to share, has loads of problems with it. And then you sort of make it faster and more shareable. We've got another one. Go for it. I could publish it. Um, I'm actually writing an app. Um, I do actually know uh, Swift. Um, so I'm actually writing an app. If anyone's interested, I've got a, an implementation on here. Um, again, it's very specialist um, for astrophotography. In terms of the Java, yes, I could. I've, I've written a library of, of calculations. Um, and I've actually translated that from Swift to, to Python to, um, to Java. Um, and those are quite useful, I think, because they've implemented quite a lot of stuff I could not find anywhere else. Um, they're very specialists. I'll... Yeah, go, go for it. And, and another one, and I was wondering about that one as well. Uh, if processing can take 99% of your CPU for 20 minutes, would you still try using cloud computing to process <laughs> that? Or yeah. current lambda? Okay, that's a very good question. So if processing takes 40 minutes, several hours uh, from this, um, you could use cloud. So, <laughs> yes, except uh, you've got to upload all of that data up to the cloud. Um, and unless you've got an incredibly fast uh, network, um, that's going to take you just as long. Again, we're talking your average image, um, once processed, is maybe 400 megabytes in size because we don't compress. Um, and you've maybe got 100 of these. Not only that, but you have to take what's called um, calibration frames. So your camera, um, this is actually quite an interesting point. When you, your camera today, whether it be one of these or, or an, an SLR, when this comes out of the factory, they know how much residual um, noise is on the sensor, and they subtract that noise from it. They also know if you've got dust on the lens or something, or there's an imperfection on the lens, they subtract that from the data. And so what you get at the end of the day is a perfect photo. And it's, if anyone's got an, a, an SLR, DSLR, or a mirrorless, there's actually a mode in it which allows you to subtract dust data, if anyone is into photography. Um, we have to do that with the astronomy on every single session. And we take 50 to 100 shots of, um, in total darkness. We take 50 to 100 shots at exactly the same temperature, at exactly the same duration, to subtract um, the information. And we take another 50 shots um, onto what's called a light panel, and that gives us, uh, subtracts any uh, dust that's on the lens. So there's 150 plus photographs of 400 megabytes each on top of, of what we're processing. Um, so Typically, we'll be pushing through on a dark winter's night maybe 300, 400 megabyte files. So this is a 96 gigabyte RAM machine, which I turn into 48 gigabytes of RAM disk, and I use the other 48 gigabytes of RAM, and, and that is, is the sort of processing power you need. Now, I could upload that to the cloud, but it's going to take me longer, probably, to upload it. And if something goes wrong, uh, you're a bit screwed. OK. Let me uh, just show you the sort of this, again, from my back garden. This is only about three hours of, of exposure. 
Uh, this, this is the other one. And there's, there's a lot of detail in there. Again, the Crescent Nebula. Now, moving on to, to closer to the James Webb to Space Telescope. The data we get is, uh, you may well remember this photo. This was the sort of famous one of, you know, is, is that gold or is this blue or is that gold? Um, I don't know if, if the laptop and the projector have done it justice. The point I'm trying to make is that every single human eye is very slightly different. They have different responses to different wavelengths. Um, and actually, the red cones that you have in your eye have a small bit of responsiveness in the blue cones. And it's very interesting to see how we can then distinguish the different colors um, from this. But as eyes are different, some people can actually see a little bit of ultraviolet. Other people can see deeper into the red spectrum. So what it means is that um, it's just an interpretation. For those of you into photography or even just using your phones, you may have taken somebody a, a photo of something in a dress or a, you know, a shirt, and that looks totally different color from what you thought you saw because the camera has been responsive to different light. And this is why we view photographs in sunlight or if they're, if they're printed, because it's different from the light we get from these LEDs and, uh, and various other things. So this, is, uh, I found it on my phone. Uh, it's an amusing photo. We, um, this guy comes from Florida. Um, same size as me, as you can see from the thing, but um, he doesn't own a coat. This was taken in about minus 10 degrees uh, in uh, Denver. We were on a business trip. These two guys are from England and they own coats. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is this is taken in infrared because just like I have lasers in my pocket, I also have infrared cameras. I, I like gadgets. Um, what I'm trying to, so the point I'm trying to make here is we, we assign different colors. Blue is dark, is, or black is, is basically cold, um, and the white here is, is the hot areas. This is infrared. So when we get into the James Webb Space Telescope, let's start off with the visual. This is the Hubble Space Telescope. We assign these different wavelengths to different colors. And there is no way of, of sort of assigning that in, in the correct way. There is no correct or wrong way. Just in visual light, red is red, green is green, blue is blue. And a photograph looks correct to us. So when we, when we look at uh, something, we basically assign different wavelengths to different colors. And this gives us, in some cases, some stunningly beautiful gradu graduations in colors. Um, we could move these around. These aren't natural colors. This isn't how you would see it. You'd still see the structure, but you wouldn't see this out. And some of these structures that you get here and, and down here, you can only see these if you mix and match the, um, the, the different colors. So we, Hubble, when they were processing the data from the Hubble Space Telescope, there's a lot we learned from that. Um, we assign uh, silicon, hydrogen, sorry, sulfur, hydrogen, oxygen into red, green, blue, and this is the sort of effect we get. That photograph, by the way, uh, is, is not uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. It's mine, again, taken from the back garden. This is what we get in, uh, this, is, this is what we, this is the uh, atmosphere, and it thankfully gets rid of all of the nasty uh, stuff up here. If we were exposed to this in the atmosphere, we'd all come out like beetroots, uh, and we'd have skin cancer, and probably wouldn't live uh, much older than about 10 years old, because we'd all die. Uh, so it, thankfully, a lot of this is taken out by the atmosphere. A lot of this is also taken out by the atmosphere. Some of these little peaks here are water vapor, and various other things, and this is the bit we see. Now, it's, the James Webb Space Telescope needs to see in this wavelength, which is why a lot of this has to go up into space. That's why it has to be super cooled, is why it has to be a long way from the Earth, uh, so that it can see these wavelengths down here. These, this isn't my actual one, but these are the filters I use. I use a filter wheel, and it, it rotates them automatically. You can see L, which is uh, luminous, red, green, blue, sulfur, hydrogen, oxygen. And I've got exactly the same, um, and we, we do these filters. The reason we use red, green, blue is we do short exposures to get the colors of the stars um, on these things. This is the James Webb Space Telescope, and each of these represents the wavelength and whether they're wide band or narrow band. And this, I actually don't know the size of this, but I can guess it's probably pretty large. Um, now, if each of these filters, now the luminous red, green, blue, they're actually quite cheap. You're talking sort of 
30 to 50 euros on these because they're, they're not narrow band, they're sort of broadband. These are the expensive ones. These, <laughs> there's probably only two in the world, and the other one's the backup. So I'm guessing these are in the tens of thousands of dollars each, uh, if, if not more. Um, but as we know, it costs several billion to send it up, so this is going to be one of the expensive parts. This is the, the different types of spectrum. So each one of these are, as you see these numbers up here, these represent the different wavelengths. Now, these colors are just so to, to separate them. The visible wavelength is basically here. So this is red, and here is about orange, I think, yeah, so 500 nanometers, so in fact, that's still red. So this is red, dark red, ultraviolet, uh, sort of infrared, and you wouldn't be able to see past about here, uh, 750, so 0.75, so up here. And these are all the different filters going way, way, way into the infrared. And so what we do, or what they do, you take one of the photos from one of these bands here, whether it be that super narrow band or this one here or this very broad band, you can also subtract that from this. So you can take this and subtract that. And, and so we can add and subtract on these things. And this gives us some of the, uh, the data you can get. Now, for anyone that's interested, I put the QR code there so you don't have to quickly note that down. Uh, so to be filled, for, you can, you'll get these slides afterwards or ask me. Um, but you can download every single image in every single wavelength from not just the James Webb Space Telescope, but also the Hubble Space Telescope and a lot of the other telescopes. Um, these are big cameras. They've got, uh, some of them have been stitched together in what's called a mosaic. And you'll find things that are maybe 12,000 by 16,000 pixels inside. They've already done the processing. And obviously, rather like the cameras here, things don't change up there. So once they've done the, the calibration, uh, they just need to take pictures. They also don't have to stack because this thing is, is not going to move and there's no satellites up there. So it, it takes pictures of, of several hours in, in duration. But I warn you, when you put in information here, you will find thousands of images. So you have to, you have to start getting rather precise. And you download these images um, for each and every uh, image that you find, you will maybe find uh, a dozen different photographs at different wavelengths. So I've been, this is one of the first ones that came out, this is called the Cosmic Cliffs in the Carina Nebula. Um, I don't actually know which ones I chose here, uh, but you can see this is right on the edge of what is something much larger here. And I basically looked for the ones with the most detail in them, uh, there's a dozen in there, I put these together. And I got this image. Now, I don't believe this has ever been published anywhere else on the internet, um, other than anywhere else you would have seen this slide. It is my unique interpretation, uh, or my unique piece of art to create this. And it's large enough to blow up and probably decorate an entire wall here. It's huge, uh, absolutely huge. So if you wanted to go out and looking for something to, uh, to display on, on walls, uh, that's, that's the thing to do. Um, some of the things we can see, the reason they process these is they can start to see features and it starts to explain um, some of the things that, you know, is what astronomers are looking for. Uh, they're trying to work out how these, um, uh, how these work, why they're there, where they come from, what they do, why they go away. Um, a lot of these stars were photographed in uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and some of them are t utterly invisible because they're behind dust, and that dust can be seen through with the infrared. But again, massive amounts of detail in these. So getting close to the end, um, timing-wise, this is the Carina Nebula. You will not be able to photograph this from Holland or the UK because it's unfortunately on the other side of the Earth in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, the size of the moon on here is, is about here. One, it's one of the things when you get into astronomy uh, is, is just how big these things are. The Andromeda galaxy is about 12 times larger than the moon, and you can see it with the naked eye. You just need to have a very dark sky to see it. Um, so this little bit here is, is this. Uh, this little bit here is, is this, and these little tiny bits here is this. So this give you some sort of idea of the amount of uh, detail and magnification we get out of this. It's 7,600 light years away, um, which is a lot of zeros if you're traveling on a local train. Um, 
it's not just imaging which the infrared is, is critical for. This is honestly the last slide. I think we're good for timing. One of the reasons we, or, or they use infrared is because as things get further and further away, they also travel faster and faster away from us. Uh, it's uh, basically the expanding universe. There are loads of interesting questions about how fast it's expanding, how big it is, because as I said before, we can't really measure distance accurately. And there's a big conundrum at the moment as to there's several different ways of measuring distance, and they don't all agree. They're all very precise, but the precision is, is, doesn't overlap. So something's wrong somewhere, which is fascinating. It's always an interesting sign when you, you're absolutely sure about that number, you're absolutely sure about that number, but they're both different, and, and that's fascinating. But as we get very, very far away and we look towards the edge of our visible universe, I, I emphasize visible universe, the universe is... Uh, much bigger, but this is what we can see. Um, these are the lines. Remember I was talking about hydrogen alpha and things? These are actually redshifted away. Just as you, if you listen to a police car or an ambulance going past, you hear the high pitch noise as it comes towards you, you hear the low pitch noise as it goes away from you, and a, and a very quick change as it goes past. In light, it's the same. These all get lower and lower. So this is, starts off in visible light, and as it moves faster away, it moves towards infrared. And everything at the edge of the universe is infrared. It all slowly moves towards the infrared. And without being able to precisely measure that, we can't judge the speed of these things as they go away. So what this is, is showing different galaxies that they found here. For example, this one here. They measure the spectrum of this, or the spectra, and they can judge or find out how fast it is traveling away from us. There's an, another one here, which is that one there. This is traveling even faster. And this one here is probably one of the furthest objects that we can possibly see with our um, anything, any technology. It's right on the edge of the universe, probably only a few hundred million years um, after the beginning of the universe. And that's what we use it for. <laughs>